Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome, welcome, all of you. Thank you so much for coming. We are so delighted to have all of you here today. I'm Eileen Berger, and I am uh, the administrator for the Access and Disability Services Office and in the Office of Student Affairs at the Ed School. We want to extend such a warm welcome to you. Uh, all of you are invited guests. We know all of you, and we appreciate your coming here today. And on short notice, <laughs> for our rescheduled um, convocation of the International Higher Ed and Disability um, Annual Gathering. We have a special program today, and my brief introduction has been extended since our student, Jenny Ruder, uh, is on, in our, on our leadership team, was unable to be here today. Uh, and she asked if Shen and I would share a few words about IHEAD on her behalf and our fourth annual gathering. And to acknowledge uh, the circumstances of our uh, rescheduling. Due to our marathon lockdown, the original symposium has been reconfigured after the tragic events we, we, uh, of the past three weeks. And so we want to thank our original panel, Elaine Hall, Stephen Shore, Laura Shifter, and Tom Hare for um, dealing with this event with us, and it's unfortunate we could not reschedule our guests from out of town, but they will be with us in some time in the coming year, and they send their regards to everyone and really miss being here. Um, the stories of each of our students today, the scholarship, mentorship of Professor Thomas Hare, are perfect reflections on the lives of achievement, advocacy, and influence for positive change in attitudes, policy and practice for people with disabilities. Today we are celebrating five years of active advocacy and the fourth annual IHEAD Symposium Roundtable. In this interdependent group of shared responsibilities and flexibilities, we are truly an inclusive organization that works for students and with students with disabilities at HDSE and across Harvard. In their chosen professions, these wonderful students will bring with them the insight they have gained through scholarship, self-reflection, mentorship, and active advocacy and actions in all events of this year and the past four and a half years. You will hear their stories today, how the past, their Harvard experiences, and the individual designs for the future will continue to have resonance and impact on their personal lives our Harvard community, and the professional lives they have chosen. And now I'd like to introduce our ambassador for happiness. <laughs> really? <laughs> <And she has, laughs> that was an actual article that was describing you, wasn't it? You can explain that. <laughs> we love Shen so much, and we're going to turn the program over to Shen Hayward. Thank Dr. You. Shen Hayward. Thank you. Thank you. As a Harvard student group, I had seeks to as a Harvard student group, I had seeks to promote um, greater participation in the disability dialogue. Um, we've worked hard over the past year uh, organizing events, organizing opportunities for dialogue, thereby strengthening the disability rights movement at large. Uh, over the past year, we've had a, a book talk several lectures on optimism, or that was my own actually, several lectures on autism. <laughs> and, <laughs> so hard to keep them straight. And <laughs> um, we had a fireside chat discussion with Michael Hitchcock, who's a writer and producer for the hit TV show Glee. Um, we had site visits to the Institute for Human Centered Design and a conference on assistive technology at UMass Boston. And most exciting, I thought, was a trip to the United Nations headquarters in New York City, where we were on a panel um, of a disability briefing in front of about 150 uh, representatives from NGOs around the world, um, and were able to present the positive psychology-oriented uh, perspective of disability as a strength um, that we've been cultivating since the inception of IHEAD. 
And none of this would have been possible without the leadership, support, and endless generosity of Eileen. So Eileen, on behalf of the members of IHEAD, it's my pleasure to present these flowers to you as a small token of our gratitude. Continuing on the theme of gratitude, last year the members of IHEAD decided to begin a tradition of recognizing an individual for his or her leadership and advocating on behalf of people with disabilities through the presentation of the IHEAD Award. And when it came time this year to decide who would be the recipient, the decision was unanimous. It's our privilege to present this award to a faculty member at the Harvard Law School this year who has become a mentor and a friend to many of us, Dr. Michael Stein. Professor Stein holds a JD from Harvard Law School and a PhD from Cambridge University. He co-founded and is now the executive director of the Harvard Law School Project on Disability, as well as Cabell uh, Professor at William & Mary Law School, as well as teaching at Harvard, NYU, and Stanford Law Schools. Um, he's an internationally recognized expert on disability rights, and he participated in drafting the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. He actively consults with international governments on their disabilities and law policies, and he serves on disability rights advocacy boards and blue ribbon research panels, as well as acting as a legal advisor to uh, many organizations, including Rehabilitation International, Disabled Peoples International, and the Special Olympics International. Um, he also works with disabled persons organizations across the world and advises a number of UN bodies, such as UNICEF, and his passion for helping all Harvard students with disabilities obtain equal access to higher education inspires all of us in IHEAD to follow his example. Although he won't be able to join us today as he's off saving the world, <laughs> we hope everyone will join the members of IHEAD in bestowing the second annual IHEAD Award to Professor Stein with the deepest amount of respect and affection. Thank you for accepting that on his behalf. Of course. I'm sure he wishes he could be here, but as she said, he's off probably saving the world right now. <laughs> um, and at, he's an extremely humble guy. With everything he's done, we end up talking about hummus the entire time. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I'm sure he'll thank all of you in particular. So thank you. Thank you. So today, we've chosen to focus on the importance of telling our stories. Telling our stories as students with disabilities is an art, and it has a powerful impact on the educational, psychological, and social development of students with and without disabilities. Um, as students with disabilities are increasingly educated alongside their peers without disabilities, um, a candid discussion of why telling personal narratives concerning disability is important. It's important for research, for personal growth, for public awareness, as well as for policy. And Professor Thomas Hare will lay a framework for this topic, followed by um, the telling of personal narratives of several past and present Harvard students. So it's now my pleasure to introduce, though he needs no introduction, Professor Thomas Hare. <laughs> he has something to say about him, too. <laughs> Back to me. <laughs> Now that I've approved your thesis, right. right? <laughs> <laughs> now I'll say what I want. <laughs> um, Dr. Hare has spent his entire uh, career advocating for students with disabilities and their families, both as a special education teacher and administrator, and as director of the Office of Special Education Programs during the Clinton administration. As professor of policy and practice here at the Graduate School of Education, Dr. Hare has played a critical role in the training of a new generation of practitioners and policymakers in the field of education. His own research and writing has contributed greatly to the fields of special ed and disability studies. Two falls ago, the Graduate School of Education appointed Dr. Hare as the first Solana and Christopher Pasfici Professor of Practice and Learning Differences, an honor that ensures, due to Dr. Hare's leadership, scholarship, and advocacy, 
that there will now always be a scholar at the Ed School specializing in special education. Despite all of these achievements, perhaps Dr. Hare's most significant contribution to the Harvard community lies in his never-ending support of Harvard students with disabilities. In advocating for the needs of these students, Dr. Hare has worked to make the first-rate education of Harvard accessible to all of its students. <laughs> Thank you, Shen, for that, and uh, thank you, Eileen, for using a picture that was at least five years old. <laughs> uh, I appreciate that. Um, I just want to kind of cue up the panel a little bit uh, today um, and uh, talk about why we think this is the, the issue of personal narratives is, uh, is so important. Uh, Shen uh, just finished her dissertation. She did a, a, a very uh, incredible uh, quantitative thesis on happiness uh, and disability, and uh, it's just an amazing piece of work. Uh, research I do is both quantitative and qualitative, um, and um, some things you can uh, you can glean through quantitative research, um, and some things you can't uh, because of the nature or the complexity of subjects. Um, one of the things we know from quantitative research um, is that people with disabilities survey research is that people with disabilities, um, uh, one of the things that jumps out in surveys of uh, particularly adults with disabilities uh, is that the common experience that many people with disabilities have is discrimination, that most people with disabilities as adults speak about discrimination when, they, when you do surveys. Um, but those who were, uh, had disabilities since they were children also speak very strongly about the low expectations that people had of them because they had disabilities. Um, and that's all part of, uh, of, of a pattern of discrimination uh, that is uh, very common among people with disabilities in these large quantitative studies. Um, the other thing we've learned from large quantitative studies is that there are um, more and more people with disabilities, young people with disabilities particularly, uh, going on to college uh, and graduate school. The numbers have actually increased uh, quite significantly uh, in the past 15 years, more than doubling. Um, this, of course, I view as a very positive uh, result of, uh, maybe potentially result, of uh, the expansion of educational opportunities to younger people with disabilities. <clears throat> when I started teaching here at Harvard, um, one of the things that uh, 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 I experienced, uh, happily experienced, uh, because I was teaching the only courses really here that dealt with disabilities, is that I would have um, quite a few students with disabilities who would take my courses some throughout the university. Um, which, uh, as someone who's in the field of, I don't like to use the word special ed. I prefer to talk about education first. <laughs> the education of people with disabilities. Um, the, um, uh, this created a challenge for me in the sense that I had to be able to provide the types of accommodations that were necessary to accommodate large classes that had significant students with disabilities. But it also provided, in a sense, a, a, a research opportunity for me um, to get to know students with, who have all kinds of disabilities um, and figure out how did they get to Harvard. Um, many of you are Harvard students, and so you have your own stories, and everybody here is a Harvard student. <coughs> and so I started, when I first started teaching here 13 years ago, asking my students the simple question, how did you get here? Um, because when you think of discrimination, you think of discrimination within education, you think of low expectations, um, uh, how does someone who was born deaf get to a school like Harvard? How does someone who couldn't learn to read in the first grade get to Harvard uh, due to dyslexia? Um, and so this really interested me. And so I'm, I've, I've interviewed several, a couple of people in this room. I can't disclose who they are, even though they're completely out about who they are. Um, <laughs> they, um, uh, the IRB does not allow me to disclose names in this study, so I can't. Um, but I started interviewing with, with, uh, with one of my doc students who couldn't come today. Um, Laura Shifter, who, um, who also uh, has dyslexia, um, we, we, we started interviewing systematically 16 uh, students that uh, I have had in class, all of whom I've had in class, all of whom had disabilities as children. Um, that was one of the criteria. 
Um, and uh, about their education, ex educational experiences and, and developmental experiences when they were young. Um, and these, uh, you know, these interviews have been um, amazing to me because they answer some questions that you can't answer from these large databases that I'm always spending time in. Um, you know, what are the subtle things that happened? Um, uh, what happened when you didn't learn how to read in first grade and second grade? How did teachers react to that? How did your parents react to that? How did you get to the point where um, you were able uh, to, to, to come to a place like Harvard? And so those are the, um, you know, that's what I've, I've been doing in the study. Hopefully I'll make a good dent in the writing this, uh, this summer. We pretty much analyzed the, uh, uh, um, all of the transcripts, which are pretty long because we've had pretty long interviews. Uh, we've done some triangulation of data with parents, um, occasionally with the permission of students. Um, and uh, so anyhow, it's been a, a very interesting study, but I think all these themes will emerge in what uh, this wonderful panel is going to be talking about today. So, um, should we start with you, Amanda? I would love that. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, um, I'll introduce you, or each panelist. Oh, I'm sorry. I can That's introduce. okay. Okay, you're introducing each panelist. I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 Say more impressive things about everybody. Um, Go for that. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> Before coming to HGSE, Amanda Grant Rose was a special education teacher a mental health specialist and director of special education for a university in Tanzania. At HGSE, she obtained her master's in international education policy, and she is now director of marketing and programs at Lift Up Africa. Great, yes, that's me. <laughs> um, I always feel like when I start this component of telling about my, my story, I should apologize because it's kind of a boring story. Um, but in but I was interviewed for the book. Am I allowed to out myself? Well, you can knock yourself. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Empowerment. We'll see how it, if I make it or if I'm on the cutting room floor at the end of the process of the book. Um, <laughs> but um, I had great parents. I had great parents. And what they taught me was we are not perfect. We cannot be perfect. We cannot meet the needs of everyone around us. But in the midst of that brokenness, essentially, great things can happen. Great things can happen. And the systems that we work in, education, special education, government, whatever we work in, is run by people. So inherently, it's broken. It can't meet the needs of every student. It can't meet the needs perfectly of every child. But despite that, great things can happen. And that's really why we're here today, I think, is to have this conversation talk about the brokenness, and then hear about the great things that are happening. Um, of the students here, of the alumni, and, and, and onward. Um, so my story. In second grade, I was sitting in my mother's lap, as we did every night, and we were reading books before bedtime, um, an image that I'm sure you guys can all picture. And I turned to my mother and I said, oh, how do you do it? How do you keep those words on the page? Um, and in her wisdom, she quickly got me evaluated and said, well, they came back to her and they said, sweet girl, very appeasing. She was lovely, but she's got some significant disabilities. Don't expect her to do much. You know, stocking shelves, you two are highly educated individuals. You need to lower your expectations of what your daughter will do. Perfect example of a broken system. Um, and what they did was they said, I understand, I hear that, we hear that there are some issues, but we're gonna teach her advocacy, we're gonna teach her how to be empowered, and we're gonna teach her how, despite the system that she'll go through, which could be good, which could be bad, that at the end of her 12 years of schooling, um, that she would do great things. And that's what we did, and that's what they did for me. And by my senior year, I was running my own IEP meetings, I had not told my parents. I pulled myself out of special education <laughs> services, enrolled myself in honors and AP classes um, without any of their knowledge, um, and I advocated for myself, and I did good things despite the system. Went to University of Arizona, who taught the exact same thing, advocacy. The system's not perfect, but what you can do is great things. They start you off with, 
so many services, you cannot fail. I mean, I had a tutor for every class, I had a writer, I had a reader, I, I had so many services. Come hell or high water, I was going to be successful in my freshman year. And I was. And then they did the same thing. They pulled away those services and they expected me to advocate for myself, know what I need, and go and get it. So after graduating from the University of Arizona, I became a special education teacher. Um, and was kinder first and second. I loved components of it. I was terrible at bulletin boards. You need to be good at bulletin boards to be your elementary school teacher. And I was terrible at them. Um, got my degree in, I moved then to Pennsylvania, got my degree in clinical social work at the University of Pennsylvania, um, and did an internship in Tanzania. Loved it. I've, I feel so at home in rural Tanzania. Loved it. And realized that as broken as the systems I had experienced, but not that that's bad, it just can't be perfect, that Tanzania had even less, that parents had even less resources, and that advocacy was something that wasn't always instilled, that if a child couldn't succeed, that they just wouldn't go to school. And when I graduated, I moved to Tanzania, I worked with the Ministry of Education and a university there, and we educated the first cohort of teachers to be special education teachers in Tanzania. And the woman that was running the program was brilliant and realized there was never going to be a way that at the end of their graduation, any of them would find jobs. There's no such thing. Like, what would they do? And so she dual degreed them, so they graduated with special education as well as regular education knowing that they would go into the education world and they would become teachers, great teachers, and would start advocating and teaching parents how to advocate for the children in the communities with disabilities. Loved my international work, and then I came here to Harvard. And I met Eileen, and we hit it off pretty quickly. Um, I forced her to give me a job, and she did. Um, and I worked with her, and we realized the same thing. The same thing my parents had taught me 28 years prior, that as much as people tried, the system is broken. It just is inherently broken. But through good dialogue, through the opportunity to talk and to get together, that really, really good things can happen. To hear the other people's stories is to empower other people and to learn to advocate for yourself. And most importantly, putting out from the education department or from Harvard School of Ed, great <coughs> teachers, great policymakers, great, just great people that also understood the importance of advocating for individuals with disabilities. And that that was just key. And that's really what started IHEC, which is really why we're here today, that a group of us thought it is important to keep this dialogue going. It's important to once a year, even if it gets postponed due to crazy circumstances, to sit in a community, talk about it, hear the stories of success, and know that really great things are happening. Yeah, so that's my story. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Our next speaker today is Ike. Um, and I'm not going to try to pronounce your last That's name. I, sorry. <laughs> I have an unpronounceable first name, so I know the pain. Um, Ike is a student in Educational Policy Management Program and is interested in working with groups that raise private ca capital for public good. He's a former officer in the U.S. Armed Services. Hello. I'm Ike. And, um, you know, I think my story is unique in the sense that I spent three years in special education in middle school, uh, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, uh, mislabeled as emotionally disturbed when it was just a mind disability. So for three years, I basically sat in the classroom colored. Um, as long as we were sitting still and behaving, everything was fine. So we didn't do any substantive English, math, reading. So when it came time to take the you know state exams, my scores were just abysmal. And I, when it came time to be promoted to high school, I knew I did not want to spend another four years like I had spent middle school. And I knew that 
I didn't want to necessarily, I knew that if I did that, that college and a future for me would be bleak at best. So I actually talked my mom into sending me to military school. And we had a public military school in Richmond. It was in a city, it would require her uh, to drive me to school every morning. She agreed to do that. I had, I had to get in. Somehow I convinced them, even with my scores, they, they took a risk. And it was the best thing I, I, I ever did. It was a highly structured environment. Um, and the Army offered me a sense of purpose. Or, or in, in that military environment, it gave me a sense of purpose, a sense of I can do, uh, I can't just isn't a, a option. And I also had a mother that never lowered her expectations of me at all. It was always, you're going to college, you're going to do, you know, to be great. Um, I did so well at the military school, they sent me to a school for talented and gifted students, despite my score still being awful. <laughs> and, um, and when I got there, uh, it was a different environment. Uh, the principal there said, well, I'm very concerned about you, so I want you to take some, I want you to go to the tech school and take some technical courses, because I'm not sure if you're college material. So I did that, that's fine, and I applied, and uh, I, applied, I went ahead and applied to college, Morehouse, and again, they looked at my scores, and they said, no. So I convinced my mom again, well, we have to go down there. We have to drive from Richmond to Atlanta, and we have to, I have to see the director. If I, if I can talk to him, I, I, can, I can get in. And my mother, God bless her soul, she said, okay. And so we drove down, uh, no, no appointment, we waited outside under the closed door for two hours, and he finally saw me, and he was reasonably impressed, and he said, I'll give you a shot, you come here for the summer, you can get a 3.0, I'll admit you. So that's what I did. I went to Morehouse, and I worked very hard. I struggled in math, and I always have. I did get the uh, 3.0, and the rest is sort of history. Uh, college was just full of obstacles, you know, socially, uh, adjusting to a new environment, you know, coming into own, my own about my, my sexuality, so there's so much going on. Uh, but I was able to eventually progress and uh, decide to go to, to law school. And once again, no scores. <laughs> <laughs> so a school in North Dakota, the University of North Dakota School of Law, said, we'll, we'll, we'll take you. And uh, they gave me a full uh, tuition scholarship. And I went there and I met a little old lady named Judy, who was the disability service advisor. And she made sure that I had everything I needed, with extra time, all my law books were put on PDF and, and audio, had note takers, and I did quite well. And um, at the end of law school, I, I sort of figured I wasn't quite ready to go out and practice. I still wanted to do more. And that's when I applied here to sort of figure out how can I do more in the public policy space, how can I do more in the, in the law space? And I came here, took one class across the, the river in the fall, and sort of became very interested in how the money works, how it goes. And so I sort of transitioned from someone who was going to be in the, <coughs> in the courtroom advocating and maybe even uh, on the, in the legislature advocating to someone who sees that we need allies in every sector. We need allies in law, we need allies in politics, we need allies in business but particularly business. We need, we need the guys in the boardroom who are setting the, the corporate policy. We need the guys in the boardroom to give us money. Um, and they are not necessarily the, the, the enemy. So I'm really interested in, in engaging the business community and figuring out how we can use that private capital, how we can use uh, their, their social capital and leverage to sort of change perceptions and, uh, and use that money to do some good. So that's, the, that's where I'm going to sort of chart out and explore. I don't know what that, that, that looks like. But the bottom line is this, through, you know, a mother who was disbelieved in me and they, you know, failure was just not an option. And people along the way that, that took some risk and said, I see something, I'm not sure we're gonna ignore these scores. We're gonna and it's it obviously, you know, I wouldn't be here without that. So it was open minded people and a wonderful support network. And uh, you know, I came here and had Tom Harris an advisor, so and I lead that really, and they, they helped me get some additional services that really helped me see, okay, it's not me, because sometimes you you graduate college, you graduate law school, you, you get into a school like this, and you still feel like, uh, I'm not sure if I'm good enough, or why am I here, or was, it, was, I, was I a, a uh, mistake? And so some of the services have helped me see, okay, well, these are my disabilities, this is what I have issues with, and now I, I know how to, to address 
touch that, so I'm, I'm a much stronger boy. So that's my story in a nutshell. <laughs> Thank you, Ike. Um, our next student is uh, Francisco Velasco. Before coming to, a to HGSC, he served in the military, and at HGSC is obtaining his master's in human development and psychology. After Hugsy, he hopes to continue his education in psychology through research in a future PhD program that will help refugee and veteran populations find a sense of normalcy. Thank you, Shen, for uh, introducing me. I guess my story is somewhat similar to a lot of people up here. Um, I grew up with a really supportive family. Went to school here domestically and overseas. And um, I'd always excelled in academics. But, um, you know, after my deployment to Iraq, kind of uh, the way I excelled in academics, I kind of diminished. Um, what happened was, I, I guess while, while I was on mission at one point, I um, ended up getting hit with an IED, which made me go from being someone that was fully capable physically and mentally to someone that was trying to kind of play catch up. So when I, when I got back to the States, I went through various doctors and uh, different hospitals. I had to get assistance with uh, learning how to speak uh, properly again. Um, even now, it, most people can't tell, but you know, I still struggle trying to find my words and speak. But you know, going through this entire process and stuff, I started realizing that um, I'm meeting different guys. There are a lot of people like me. So for me, it was like I found myself uh, kind of committed to the cause of helping people with, uh, I don't like to use the word kind of like disabilities because I almost feel like uh, that's kind of demeaning. Just people who have uh, kind of an obstacle that they need to overcome. And um, I think through the entire process, that's kind of what's motivated me to uh, be an advocate and at the same time try to figure out uh, what I can do not only to help myself and kind of use those techniques or strategies that I've learned to help other people. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's just uh, it's real difficult for me to even actually be out here in the open and speak about it. But, um, you know, thank you for having me today. And, you know, hopefully I can expand or elaborate a little bit more. But, you know, I try not to revisit this actual specific I issue because it's been, uh, you know, such a long task to even get here. And I guess to answer your, your question, Professor Hare, I don't know how actually how I got here because... <laughs> 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 So I feel like I've just been a work in progress the entire time. So well, thank, thank you for you. having me. Thank you so much, Francisco. And um, if you could hold on to the, the FM. Uh, yes, sir. Yes. Sure. Yeah, it's not a mic, but it. it sure. mm -hmm. Great. Um, so before coming to HDSC, Ben Howe was a student studying architecture and psychology at Carnegie Mellon University. At Hugsy, Ben is obtaining his master's in human development and psychology. He wants to be a designer and help create educational tools, technologies, and interventions to improve children's learning. After Hugsy, he plans to start his own toy company, Uniblox. Hi, everyone. Um, so I have two things. I was born with a very rare birth defect that starting from birth, I've been in the hospital my whole life pretty much for like the first 10 years of my life, in and out of hospitals. And that taught me to look into it as something that I can always overcome. Um, I knew I could, once I got over it, and I'm considered 115% success right after I was 10, I just always use it as something in the past to keep me going. So I've always been super determined all my life. And then I also have learning disabilities. And I think one of the themes we've talked about is our family. So my mom's a teacher, so she's always watched out for me. And she also watched out for me with my birth defect. So I was put in a very high private school, very prestigious. Ike made fun of me when he met me this year. He lived in the same town. We're from the same city. I'm not that kid. Um, <laughs> So I had, there was a person there with a PhD, knew what he was doing, took care of me, always informed the teachers what I had, what I needed to do to achieve. I achieved really high, very high functioning. Um, and then during that, um, I say during my high school years when I started to really process 
my birth defect even more, and I turned to art as a way to express my emotions and feelings. And what was great about it is I didn't have to tell people what I had. They could just look at my work and feel it and see it. Um, so I brought this piece with me. Um, this is actually what I looked like when I was in surgery. You guys can pass it around if you want to. Um, you can see me in surgery when I was four. I learned how to walk again when I was little. Um, but So I look into it as my past was painful, and that's why the spikes are there. But I know I can always overcome it, and I just kind of sheltered and put it in the past. Um, and I did a senior art show, and I me mentored um, fourth graders during my senior year. And I put in my art show uh, outside their classroom, and kids walked by. And there was another piece I had that was about bullying. And it was very abstract art, but the kids walked by and they went, wow, that's sad. They just could like feel the emotion in my work. And they started a blog around the whole lower school, um, because I went to the K-12 school, started talking about bullying. And it went around the whole school, and then my mom was like getting phone calls from her students, because she's a K-12 teacher, and saying, oh, they saw Ben's work, and they were so sad, but we talked about da 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 da, -da. Then after that, I went to Carnegie Mellon, um, and I guess I, everything had been taken care of me with services, and I'd always thought of myself just as normal. And I didn't really, like, some professors would give me the accommodations, some wouldn't, and so I just sort of, like, sucked it up and tried to act as normal as possible. And I didn't really know how to advocate myself until I got here and I met Eileen. <laughs> and she really taught me how to explain what my disabilities were and talk to professors on what I need to do when I was struggling. And she wanted me to talk about experience with Professor Mason here. I took S40. And the first like two or three assignments I got a C and I was like, what am I doing wrong? And I went to Professor Mason and I'd like talk to her and she'd be like, you get everything, but you missed like one thing. And we found out that it was just like this issue with executive functioning. She would sit down before each assignment, go through everything with me. Eileen taught me the strategies, talked about it before the assignment. Next time it instant A pluses on the rest of the assignments the rest of the way. So really thankful for Eileen for teaching me how to advocate more for myself. Since I couldn't do that really, I guess, at CMU, and that's probably why I left architecture, they just didn't care about you. You just try to act as normal as possible. I guess that'd be my story. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Before coming to HDSC, Rich, Rick Birnbaum, I graduated with a BA from Amherst College and went on a unique career journey with stints as an actor, writer, stand-up comic in New York City, a fitness trainer, a culinary trained, um, culinary school trained cook, a tech trader, and finally in education working in urban schools. He graduated from Huggins <coughs> in 2011 with a master's in human development psychology and went on to work with CAST as a research associate exploring universally designed learning environments. In the fall, he'll be entering a PhD program in school psychology at Michigan State University. Thank you, Dr. Hayward. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk about my disabilities in the context of school and not in any um, general sense. Because really, for my particular disabilities, the, the context, the environment, and the specific tasks that I'm involved in really drastically influence the expression of my disabilities. And in school, really more than any other context is really where I've run into the largest barriers. Um, the other important thing, very important thing for me to note is that I am an alumni of Amherst College and of Hugsey. So whatever the extent of my learning disabilities and my s academic struggles may be, the reality is that my strengths greatly outweigh my weaknesses. And my weaknesses are really far from debilitating. You know, I'll, I'll take some credit for uh, hard work and perseverance and all that, but really it's ridiculous in the scheme of things to not acknowledge the obvious. That really in the universe of people with learning disabilities, I'm really one of the incredibly fortunate ones. Um, so here's my story. Um, I wasn't diagnosed with learning disabilities until I was well into my adult years. Uh, before then, I thought I just had certain academic strengths and weaknesses, having some good days in school and some glaringly bad ones, but all the while being very highly motivated and consistently putting forth um, great effort. Um, I always had an interesting personality. I guess my career list is part of that. Um, and, a, and a very strong creative streak, but I never really suspected anything more than that. Um, I discovered that I had dyslexia and ADHD when I was 32 years old while taking a microbiology class at the University of Vermont. 
Um, during that time, I uh, met with a reputable psychologist, went through a battery of tests, um, and was given a list of the industry standard suggestions that were supposed to scaffold all my particular academic challenges. Um, I was fully encouraged to continue on with my career pursuit at the time. I had um, accepted and I wound up entering a post-baccalaureate pre-medical program at Tufts University um, with the hopes of becoming a physician. Just to add that to my list of things, I guess. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, soon after that I started the program, the many learning suggestions and accommodations that were recommended in my disability evaluation didn't work for me. And I simply couldn't get my work done in time, and despite whatever effort I put through. And not very long into that program, I was encouraged to drop out, end that career pursuit, and also encouraged to forego any thoughts about professional or graduate school, because I was told that my disabilities were actually way too incapacitating for academic success. So as an intensely competitive, very ambitious individual with a really heavy work ethic, and a college degree from a very competitive college, I was totally confused, humiliated, frustrated, angry, depressed, and with very, very destructive self-doubt. Um, fast forward two years later, after picking myself up and dusting myself off enough, um, I had begun a career in education, working with low SES kids in New York City. And once again, I got the major itch to go back to school, despite my previous experience at Tufts. And ultimately, I was accepted into Hugsy and chose to enroll really specifically after having a great conversation with Eileen at the Office of Student Affairs. Um, it was in that initial conversation where she was incredibly encouraging and supportive and really made me feel safe despite my self-doubt and anxiety about being able to keep up with the academic rigors of, of, uh, of Hugsy. Um, she also encouraged me to get involved with IHEAD as a way for me to find kinship in the supportive community and to help me learn about myself and my disability while working to promote disability awareness and positively influence and educate the Hugsy community. Eileen was right. <laughs> <laughs> and it was exactly what I needed to do. And I'm forever grateful. Um, while I did eventually succeed academically in my time here at Hugsy, there were a lot of bumps along the way. And I, because I was working hard to discover really, A, the nature of my disabilities, and B, why I ran into trouble at Tufts. Um, I definitely don't have all the answers today, but I know a lot more than I did when I began. Um, ultimately, kind of big picture, I learned that my brain is really wired in an incredibly unique way, and that those learning disabilities that really manifest, that manifest in particular academic contexts, or when I'm performing certain tasks, really present as great abilities or in creative strengths in others. So simply, it's really the context that matters the most. The, the key for me is really to understand that the nature of that interaction between me and the environment, the context, and the specific tasks that I'm asked to perform, and then really allow my strengths um, to guide me at the same time while managing and scaffolding whatever weaknesses that I may have. Unfortunately, there's often a conflict between my weaknesses and freeing up my strengths. And there's no perfect balance or formula it's a constant dilemma. Um, but I've made a conscious choice to really do my best to try to honor my strengths. And even if that means a lot of things become drastically more difficult and frustrating and time consuming, because I've learned really that the final product is ultimately worth it in the end. And really through Eileen's support and the rest of the Hugsy community, I was really able to make that choice and flourish here um, but during my time here. Um, this fall, I'll be going back to school, yes, beginning a PhD program in school psychology at Michigan State University, go Spartans, and I'll be pursuing licensure as both a psychologist and a school psychologist. And while I'm excited and very much looking forward to the experience, I'm also filled with a certain amount of anxiety about my prospects for success. Um, it's a different academic context in a different environment with different demands. And while I have done my due diligence, I'm still unable to completely rid myself of doubt. Um, my hope is that the administration and the faculty are obviously as supportive as they were here at Hugsy. But the reality is that that anxiety is also part of what life is like as an individual with a learning disability in an academic context, particularly when encountering that new situation. It's always being somewhat on guard, never 100% feeling confident, 
and having to drum up that little bit of extra courage to ultimately take that leap of faith to know that everything's going to work out and everything's going to be okay. So really, that's kind of where I am right now in my own journey. Um, moving ahead, way more confident than I've been in, in years, but definitely aware that I have a bunch of room to grow. Um, I'm looking forward to the future as I move forward through all these different environments and I evolve cognitively, emotionally, socially, professionally. Um, and I just want to say one more thing. Lastly, my, my decision to pursue a career in school psychology was really grounded in my desire to work with, with students and teachers, administrators, families, and whole communities um, to help them create supportive and nurturing academic and social environments that inspire talent and courage and morality and gratitude and kindness, environments that were similar to what I experienced as a part of IHEAD and working with Eileen and being a part of the greater Hugsy community. Because really, in the end, whether one has a disability or not, it's really that proactive and proactively supportive and deeply connected community that provides the ideal foundation for fostering individual and group success in virtually <laughs> any context. Thank you. Thank you, Rick, and thank you all the panelists. And now we're going to take some time for questions. Um, and I'm wondering, to start off, if Tom, if these were themes that you found throughout your interviews, and if you could help crystallize what those themes are. Um, qualitative research is complicated in terms of figuring out what's really, you know, what are the really salient themes. You have to go through and go through interviews over and over again, and so forth. And but one of the, there, there are certain things that, um, that, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not being very accessible here. Um, there are certain things that uh, um, come, come across very strongly in the interviews. One is parents. It's very, very big uh, in these interviews. That parents make, parents make a huge, uh, have a huge Im impact, particularly in a protective sense. Because so often what, what uh, particularly for students, particularly with students with learning disabilities, you know, where their disabilities go right to academic performance, um, that often what they hear from schools is negative. They don't take tests well. They, you know, they're not learning how to read, etc. Um, and so parents uh, come across very, very strongly in these interviews. Um, one of the other things that comes across strongly uh, that really took a couple of, a, a, you know, a couple of read-throughs to really uh, crystallize in our minds, Laura Schiffer and myself, because we code these separately and then we talk about them together, um, is that the students in these samples were intellectuals at a young age, that, that, they, that they really were students, uh, and, and so it wasn't just a parent who was protected, in a sense the student themselves um, was someone who was really interested in learning things, of, of, of uh, you know, wanting to be challenged. And that, that comes across uh, very strongly in, in the interviews. We didn't even ask a question about that. That was just something that really came across, you know, that, uh, you know, we have anecdotes, you know, with a student saying, I told my teachers, you know, teach me more, please. I'm, I'm bored. Um, there's, there's, there's one guy we interviewed who, uh, uh, who uh, uh, has, uh, I don't want to identify him too easily because I'm not supposed to do that. He's not here. Um, but um, we had a speech therapist, for instance, who recognized his, uh, his desire for, for intellectual challenge. And so his speech therapist every week brought him a new book to read. And the speech therapy that the, he conducted was around that book. And the kid ate, read the book every, every week. You know, because he was so hungry for that. That's something that came across that that uh, uh, was was really striking. Um, this notion of metacognitive understanding of what your disability is. Um, either they didn't have that and that became a real obstacle for them. You know, they, it, it shows up in the interviews in both positively and negatively. Um, there are students who, by the time they were in third and fourth grade, had a deep understanding of what the nature of their disability was uh, and what, uh, what it wasn't, because so often what they heard were negative things. And those students tended to, to, in a sense, do the best, have the least problems in school, because early on they, they, they had figured it out, the schools had figured it out, 
and they and they got the uh, the accommodations and supports that they needed, and they didn't go through this psychological thing of you know am I capable you know to, and so forth. But that shows up differently in the interviews because for some students it wasn't until very late that they got this metacognitive understanding of the nature of, of their disabilities, um, like you heard from Rick today. Um, that, 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 that's here very strongly as well. The other thing that is a theme that comes across from an educational perspective has been the, um, the benefits of technology that for many students um, uh, uh, in the, or many people in the sample, people who they were students, um, they, uh, you know, most of them are, you know, are, were graduate students. Most of them are in the 30, 30 uh, age range. Um, most of them went to school as the digital re revolution was taking place. And for, for many of them, that made a huge difference in terms of access to um, um, written material, uh, uh, text-to-speech, speech-to-text. Um, those sorts of things made a big difference in their ability to produce what was expected to be produced in school, or even just communication devices, because there are some people in the sample who use communication devices. So again, those are, those are some of the big ones um, that uh, come across uh, in the book. The last one being, uh, not just parents, for some of the students, not all of them, um, there were particular teachers or therapists who had a huge positive influence on their lives. Sometimes it may have just been one teacher um, who said, um, honey, you're really bright. Um, that's, probably, that's one of the quotes. You're really bright. And don't let this reading thing throw you. Um, you know, there were the, but they also, there's also some terrible stories about how teachers um, really were, were very, very negative influences. Thank you. Um, does anybody else have any questions for Tom or for the panel? Um, so, uh, listening to this is so pleasant, but it's so difficult because I feel like I see myself in a little bit of a different story here. And I guess, similar to all of you, um, I've managed to overcome some of those obstacles by compensating in other ways and showing people that you know you can make it in a competitive environment even though standardized testing for instance might be the measure which they use to let people into a particular school my question would be how do you or better better said do you think there are other people like yourself at other schools Harvard, for instance, different schools at Harvard that see the potential in students and yet overlook or look over some of the things like standardized test scores. Do they see potential in other ways? And, and, and is there a way to um, for them to convince the administration to let them in, despite bad test scores or something like that? Um, do you want me to give you a crack at that in terms of these interviews? Um, yes, please. The, um, one of the things that does come across in a number of the interviews is that the students themselves, um, it kind of harkens to what Rick said, um, and, and several other people say, say here, I think it's just obvious with what people have said, sometimes bring other things to the table that make people say, oh my goodness. Like two of the students, for instance, are absolutely brilliant in math. And so even though they couldn't read, struggled mightily with reading, they were the best kid in school in math. And so that's all that this people needed. Um, you know, other, uh, another one of the people in, in the book uh, was just a gifted musician. Um, and, you know, that changed the way in which people looked at them. Like there was something. Um, you know, by and large, the, the, again, when Amanda talks about broken systems, you see a lot of brokenness in these um, in these uh, interviews. You see, you know, like a, one one of the students has cerebral palsy. You know, pretty significant cerebral palsy. And second grade teacher was really upset that he couldn't color within the lines. I mean, mother of God, please. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just like 
you know, what planet are you on? And you know, but you're, you're, you're only seven years old. How does that influence you in the second grade? It's devastating. And so you have, there are two, there are two to be honest with you, there are more stories about the system being broken than being responsive. But, but there are still, as Amanda said, and I, I, and I love the way you described this, Amanda, because this is very, uh, there are still people within the system like the speech therapist, I saw the, you know, the giftedness in, in, in this uh, student who was deaf, um, that, uh, that that made a difference. Um, the, the thing, though, that is really striking, though, are the parents. Um, the, the amount of, uh, the length that some parents had to go to to counteract the brokenness of the system is really quite stunning in many of these interviews. And it's uh, it's not something we should ex have it. We shouldn't have that expectation, in my view, <coughs> that kids have totally exceptional parents um, to counterweight what the system should be doing naturally. In my view. Uh -huh. Yeah, I have a kind of a follow-up question that's related to a comment you made, and also. How we can affect change at Harvard. So you mentioned that example with the uh, teacher uh, saying, "Why can't you color inside the lines?" And I feel that sometimes this happens uh, here at Harvard in the graduate program, say with kids who maybe don't have parents who are going to advocate for them. Kids, okay, so like people in their twenties and thirties um, who who are here working on graduate programs, and and I'm on the committee of academic studies for my department, so I hear a lot of um, kind of behind door comments and some of them have been really discouraging about how well maybe if you have a disability you just can't cut it here or something like to the, like direct probably illegal comments I'm going to say and so I'm wondering what is the best way you know for us to affect change with people who maybe are completely unaware of what uh, disability and um, access and all these terms that we're very comfortable with here, how do we reach these people who have no training in that, who are from a different era, so to speak, and, but are in positions of power? And what they think about disability really matters. And, and so I'm wondering, are there, uh, what can we do? If anyone has any comments on that, that'd be great. Oh, um, sure. <laughs> in, um, thanks. In, in my experience, and then I'll, I'll pass it on, um, what has ended up working for me and completely transforming my Harvard experience, um, because I was, uh, when I first came as a student, I encountered a lot of obstacles uh, around disability access and accommodations, and, um, and to be well, to be perfectly honest, what really changed for me was meeting Eileen and Tom. And um, so I think that it's worth spending the time trying to find those people that, that do get it and that are willing to um, help you advocate. Uh, because I think, I think in the situation that you're asking about, when somebody is in a position of power um, but doesn't really get it, um, I think that it often does take reaching another person who has power and having them help you advocate. Um, at least in my experience, that seems to have been the only way that uh, I was able to get the sort of services and accommodations that I needed. Um, I'm wondering if anybody else has had any experiences like that and can speak to that question about what works in terms of um, getting what you need to perform as a student. During my undergrad, I actually had a uh, difficulty getting any kind of access or assistance. And I even had a professor that made a comment uh, about me having some type of disability, and I didn't believe that it was possible or true because I looked like someone that was completely functioning. So what I did was something probably a little bit uh, out of the ordinary. I filed a congressional inquiry, 
Uh, <laughs> 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 Clint also uh, consulted with a strategic consulting firm that I had met during uh, my prior experience overseas. And uh, I, I was just really, uh, I felt like I was violated by how, how badly he embarrassed me and treated me that. I figured that he, you know, I had to bring a balance back to kind of the situation. So I had to make sure to let him know that, uh, yes, he's a professor and he is in a place of power, but he has to answer to somebody else as well. And I think that when you deal with matters that are this serious and this urgent, you can't just posture. You have to actually move with a sense of purpose and have action behind it. Because, you know, I can just only imagine students probably before me that came there, the kind of issues that they've had in the past. You know, and also at the same place, I even, uh, the other issue I had there was, um, there was a, another kid there that, um, he was a double amputee. Uh, he couldn't even get access into a building that didn't have out an elevator. So, and they refused to move the classes to a different place so you could attend. So that's why I feel like you really do have to extend yourself into these areas to where there can be some real oversight. Or else at the end of the day, kind of the pattern will continue to repeat itself. I can speak to that as well. I think you have to have a advocate and you have to advocate for yourself. Um, and, but there's a, another, another component, and that is in the subjects in which you excel, excel and do excellent. Um, there are schools around this university that are not so open to um, disability access and services. And I've taken some classes at that particular school, and I just knew to excel and to, to throw myself into it. I also, you know, I had Eileen, and I also had an all school beauty. And um, so where I could, where I was strong, I really just worked hard. Where I knew I was weak, I did my best, which is all you, you can do. But you do have to speak up and stand up for yourself, and you have to have an advocate within the system, be it a senior faculty, be it someone who's uh, you know, in ABS. You have to have someone that's in the system that can speak on, on your behalf to combat some of these ignorance. Um, I, think, I think we still have a very significant issues here at this university, to be honest with you. Um, I, um, it, and it's, it's, it's spotty, it's different from one place to another, it's a very big place. Um, uh, on the one hand, I think that there is a desire um, among some folks to consider disability as another form of diversity that people should value, and we should be actually seeking students who have disabilities as we do other, other diverse populations. For instance, the admissions office in the undergraduate school, um, a number of uh, people who work in that office took my course because they wanted to learn more about disability in their role as admissions offices. And so um, that, I think, was very, very positive. Um, on the, the negative end, I've seen students who have required the most simple accommodations uh, not be given them. Um, and you know it's like moving the classroom. If you don't move the classroom, then that, that access is never applied. If you don't provide a scribe and someone needs a scribe, then that access is not provided. And I do think that there is there has been some uh, real um, I think there's been some real progress here on these issues. We, you know because of people like Eileen, um, but uh, I, I still get stories. Um, when I first met Shannon, I couldn't believe some of the stories she told me. And one of, there was a guy who was here who graduated last year from Harvard College who had cerebral palsy. Um, and after his freshman year, he wrote a lengthy letter to, to President Faust about his issues. Um, uh, he didn't get a response to it. And things actually got worse for him his sophomore year. I mean, simple things like scribes not provided, um, you know, that he needed a, and, and uh, in order to demonstrate how brilliant he was and is, um, and uh, eventually uh, I wrote a letter to, to, to President Faust and had a meeting with her about this, and she said she was embarrassed when she actually found out what had happened with this particular student. Um, so I mean, he just wasn't going to take it, um, you know. And he was uh, fortunately, I mean, uh, he's in my book, and I know a lot about him. And uh, but he, um, you know, from the time he was really little. 
his parents wanted him to be a self-advocate. And so he had all of those skills when he rolled onto this campus. And uh, he, um, he just was not going to take it. And I think that a lot of people with disabilities have taken it in the past. They're just withdrawn because, the, because there hasn't been the response from the power structure that needs to occur. I mean, we have had Section 504 for a very long time. Um, and yet, and it's applied to this university, you know, for over 30 years. And yet, there's some very basic issues of access that I think we still struggle with. Be honest with you. I think that's what we're here today. And that's really why I had started, so that we could have this dialogue and, and share ideas and share stories. And that's why it needs to continue every year, so that new people can get brought into the fold and, and hear about these great stories and read your book to be soon published. And, um, <laughs> a year later. <laughs> <laughs> In a couple of years, we'll read that book. <laughs> um, but that's so why I had so important. I, that's why I, you know, proud that we did this a couple of years ago. I'm proud that it continues today. Are there any more questions, John? Yeah, um, I had a question about Frank, actually. Um, and um, I just, you know, your story about riding from Virginia to Atlanta. And I just wanted to know, um, I just wanted to know how, how many, like, do you have many of those stories? And when you get down there, I get the feeling that you weren't just providing uh, objective evidence for why you should be given a shot. You made a human connection. So do you have, have you developed kind of an elevator pitch about yourself that you can just explain to people? <laughs> 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 no, really, I mean, I think, do, do, do you have a way to crack crack open um, like a dialogue and get some resonance and then that, that works to your benefit to get the, that response from people or, or like what's the story? No, there's no elevator pitch and I probably should, 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 should work at one. Um, I just had a, a interview yesterday where it was like, tell me about yourself and it was, uh, <laughs> 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 I, I hate that question. Um, no, I just, it's just been determination and perseverance. My, I remember my mother sharing uh, something with me about Abraham Lincoln as a child. And she told me about all the, the um, challenges he had, about his wife dying, about losing this office, losing that office. And he would lose a congressional office and then, you know, run for state and run for U.S. Senate. He would lose the U.S. Senate and then run for, for a VP. So I just knew if I persevered over and just kept going and just kind of hitting away at the rock, so to, so, so to speak, that eventually something would happen. But I, I did make a human connection. One of my strengths is uh, I'm fairly articulate, and so that catches people's attention. And so once I can get myself in front of them, they look at the test scores, and they hear me speak, and they, they instantly know something is amiss. And uh, also, like most of us, there also there's also a great discrepancy in my scores. My verbals are particularly high for some of with my uh, learning abil uh, ability, and my math is particularly low. And so I think that's a red flag as well. So you no, know, if I can just get in front of someone typically, I'm okay. But I don't have a pitch, and maybe I should go on. Market that. Market that. Yeah. Um, Tom. Uh, Uh, I'm just curious, you know, from uh, from Ike and um, Francisco. Very in very broad terms is my question: What is it like to have been an active soldier, right, and then to leave the service and come and uh, develop your thinking around your disability? I mean, it's it's a it's a, it's a shift. It's a real, it's a real shift. I mean, we're, we're talking about cultures. We're talking uh, in this discussion about the culture of university, uh, and and just to to my mind, from my experience, the culture at the School of Education is quite different from other cultures. This has been said at Harvard, so and at other schools at Harvard. So it goes to a, a kind of ethereal question: Why is that so? Why why are there such vastly different cultures in the same university? And how does how does the military background inform how you think about yourself and your disability now? I would 
say the uh, transition is actually it's very complicated because there's a lot of variables you have to deal with that uh, I feel that you're not really suited for when you come to school. There, it's uh, you're really not allowed to have an opinion. When you're told to do something, you have to execute. Uh, also, living conditions and the way you communicate with people are completely different. You know, here it's very civil, especially in my field that I was born in the combat arms. <laughs> it's uh, it's very barbaric. Right. You know, it's kind of your praise for for having a violence of action. You know. And then when you transition to a place like just Cambridge in general, <laughs> or it's kind of, I told Eileen, it's kind of like uh, receiving a big hug from everybody. <laughs> it's, it's very, very difficult. You know, you really have to learn how to, you really have to develop speech that's really fitting for a completely different group of people. And, um, but I'd say overall, the one thing that they allow you, that they give you that's supportive, is that you learn to be comfortable when you're always uncomfortable. So. We had very different experiences. I was a headquarters officer, so uh, <laughs> a little different experience. But um, I think the Army is so structured that you just sometimes don't have room or you don't have time to even think and process. But I also kept my disability concealed from the Army from day one. I never disclosed it, um, um, ever. It's just not something I knew in that community that would be perceived as a weakness. And so it's just not something I ever discussed, talked about, or let hinder me. Um, but again, as an officer, I had a little more flexibility in how I did things and the way I did things. But it is a culture where you're just growing in with everyone and you learn very quickly how to be comfortable being uncomfortable. And so I think I'm probably so used to it, it didn't, it wasn't a difficult transition. Um, and as, as I think about it, I just got out officially in November. Uh, unofficially, my last day was in July. But I'm this summer will, will be the first time I have to really process that. And I had the experience of you know being in the military and reserves throughout my entire education experience. So my last last year in college, law school, you know. So it's a different experience. Um, I'm not quite sure if that answers your question, but I hope it helps. Just curious, um, I guess from probably each of you and, and Dr. Hare, um, whether you can talk a little bit about just you know your education and then sort of your plans about your career. Um, I know some of you have already worked, but you know about and I'm speaking on behalf of I have a brother-in-law who was went to this you know special education. And he um, he's high functioning, however, uh, he's been able to I think be successful in the work because he's part of a family business um, outside of that family business. Uh, you know, and I talk to my wife about it and, uh, a lot, and we, we often wonder how well he would actually do in the, in the workplace if he, he didn't, wasn't attached to this family business. So I wonder if each of you and, and Dr. Eric could talk about just the, how you feel about that, uh, you know, that transition. Um, I think one of the things that uh, I've actually spent a good deal of my career um, working with kids with intellectual disabilities. So I've, I've, I'm old. I've done a lot of things. Um, but but one of the things that um, one of the things that I think we need to think very seriously about. And this is not just for people with intellectual disabilities, but for people who have disabilities that are going to continue to need supports in the community as, uh, as they leave school, of, of how the service systems react to that need. People who need PCAs, people who might need interpreters, uh, people who might need job supports, living supports, etc. cetera. Um, and I'm, I, I just uh, left the board of the National Down Syndrome um, Congress. And that is the biggest issue for people with Down syndrome is, you know, is the adult service delivery system not being responsive to the desires of people with Down syndrome and their parents for ha being able to live in the community, work in the community, and, and, and be fully integrated.
given that, a, that most, not all, people with Down syndrome need supports um, into adulthood. And I, I think it's, I think it's we, we have systems that are based on, uh, on, on two kind of, of um, I, I would say, um, uh, less than adequate assumptions. One is the assumption of independence, that, um, that our goal for many disability programs is independence. It says it in the, in the legislation, et cetera, et cetera. And, but you know, most people are interdependent. And you know, valuing interdependency, I think is something that we really need to be thinking about more in disability policy. I think in all policy, I think this independence notion is something that's very Eurocentric, um, something that doesn't translate well in, in many, many cultures that are part of this culture today, particularly Latino cultures and so forth, that parents of, of Latino kids say to me, well, why would I want him to be independent? Nobody's independent. They're all part of a family, you know. And so there, this notion of in, independence, I think, is something we need to question. And look at policies that recognize that people uh, interdependency. The, the other thing that is, that is all um, enshrined in policy in the United States that I think is very problematic for people with disabilities who continue to need supports as adults is the notion, notion of in, incapacity. So on the one hand, we, we have the, the, the notion of, of independence, and we want it to have people be independent. Um, but we also recognize, for instance, with the Social Security system, that there are people who, quote, unquote, can't work. And, and so that system is designed around incapacity. Um, and we need something that's in the middle of these two, uh, 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 of these two polar opposites um, that I think we really have to think about in the future as it relates to disability policy. Because though neither of those poles work for a, a lot of people. And, the, and we need to look at systems that are much more supple and able to support people in the community, support people in work, us, with the assumption that the vast majority of people can work. But many people um, can work if they get the supports they need to work. And so again, I think that that's something that I think we have to, you know, that we have to explore. I have, um, I have federal policy class, and um, there's a woman who, uh, and, I, and, and in the federal policy class, the students have to present the proposal to people in Washington around a, a federal policy issue. And one of the people who responds to this is a woman named Madeline Will, who was assistant secretary under uh, President Reagan, the Office of Special Education. She has a son with Down syndrome. And she's a very active advocate in Washington um, for, for people with intellectual disabilities. And you know what she said to the students is, you know, I haven't figured this out yet, but we hope you figure it out, because the systems just don't work, um, and they're expensive, um, but they're not working to provide for what what people really need who have who have disabilities and continue to have support needs as adults. So I think we all need to think about that. Can I add just two quick things? The first is just a fun anecdote from when I lived in. I uh, worked at this great university, and they were doing everything right. They were hiring individuals with disabilities. They were they were just doing it right. Uh, but there were a couple things that they didn't think through. And I lived in a uh, little hut in the middle of nowhere, and it, it was required to have a security guard. Um, and they gave me a security guard that was blind. Um, and he, this, my security guard, he was blind. And it was, as he identified, not the best placement. Um, he does. He did a lot of great things. He excelled at the things he did well. He excelled, but having a blind security guard isn't necessarily the best. You know, linking up the best skill sets with the best job requirements. And so there is some of that, right? Um, and I am a perfect example of that. I am the director of marketing and programs for an international nonprofit. An individual with significant dyslexia should not be the person that is writing donors and just giving, you know, like, I should never just write a newsletter and send it out. Um, <laughs> never. There are so many misspellings and grammar issues that it is unbelievable. Um, but I have the right people in my life that will edit. I have the right technology. Um, and the things that I do well, I excel at. Um, and so then when there are those things where I need extra support, we just, you know, we 
make it work, I have the people in my life that I know I can turn to and say, this newsletter, this donor letter, this, this whatever needs to be edited. Um, and sure enough, there's a lot that needs to be into that. Um, but the messages are always right, and the, the information is always right. Anyway, it's terrible. Why am I director of marketing? Right? <laughs> no, I, would, I, would, I would disagree um, with that, but that's not right for writing commander. <laughs> Which were also all edited before they got to you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, it's definitely a, I think, a thing that we, you write, we do have to really think about. It's because mm -hmm. adults who don't have Eileen Berger, they don't, she doesn't actually come with you. <laughs> <laughs> safety net for his family business. So I would say, send him out there. Let him, I mean, I've been thrown into some incredible situations. I've been a campaign manager, I ran a business, the army would just throw me into situations, and I never drowned. I mean, that, there were some struggles, there were some times I was just maybe treading water, but I, you know, it, it, I got there. And uh, as we say in the army, it's OJT, on the job training. So I would say, you know, send him out there, let him know what what's available in terms of technology, but let him go. If it doesn't work out, which I doubt, he can always come back home, right? He can always come to your family business. So I just say, try something new, and you know, again, I hate to go back to my mom, but she, I remember being on a, a, a church trip, and there was a girl behind me who had M&Ms, and I was seven or eight years old, and I kept looking at the M&Ms, and I kept looking at my mom. I kept looking at the M&Ms, I kept looking at my mom. And she says, do you want one? And I said, yes, but what if she says no? And she says, if she says no, you're, then you're in the exact same position you are now. <laughs> <laughs> That's the situation. <laughs> yeah, and I, I actually have to agree with Ike, but I would say probably uh, kind of present it to, uh, you know, outside of the family business slowly to, to different events and also you know, bring the technology to them and then maybe have somebody explain how to utilize them. Because a lot of technology that I use is very complicated. If I have someone spend like six or seven hours, you know, for about a week telling me how to utilize it, you know, when it's appropriate, I'd probably never be able to figure it out myself. So I think maybe just kind of, you know, in small increments, allow them to have that freedom and explore, you know, what actually works for him. So a lot of times I notice other people try to kind of project what they think will work for me, but I know what works for myself. So you know, step by step. I don't know if I can speak to job markets because I've never had a full-time job. <laughs> uh, I can speak to the process of it mm -hmm. and what I'm finding, I had one task and I panicked when I got at Tylene and it was, you have an hour to write something back. And I was like, what do I do if I need extra time? And I like emailed them and they're just like, no, it, they're not going to do anything. So I was just like, forget it. I just like suck it up and act it. And I got rejected and I'm so glad because I would never want to work with them. But I would say like my best leads are like people I know. It's just like introducing who you are. Once they get to know you, then they like pay attention more to you. Plus our Harvard helps. Then they'll take your rest of five seconds long. That's about all I can say. Um, I would say just similar, I think what I, I talked about a little bit is that context really matters to me. Like, because to understand that whatever and it's not even about disability, it's just for anyone. You know, in some, you may be a great baseball player, but merely don't belong on a particular team. It, there's nothing that's sort of absolute. And same thing with, with jobs. You may be a great, you may have a great skill, but that skill doesn't really translate in one particular job so well. And in one place, you may be perfect, and in another place, not. And because ultimately, with, with everything, it really is that interaction of individual and environment and what's going around. So if there's a particular environment with it where, you know, where there's good supports, where all those things are there, it might be great, it might stink. Mm. But you gotta, I think ultimately you gotta try, you know, and, and you see what happens. Um, I, don't, there's, I don't think there's ever gonna be, a, there's no way to sort of quantify it and know. You always, I think, with a lot of the stories either way, there's, a, there's this sort of big leap, there's a big leap of faith and having a little bit of courage to just do it and to, to fail. And maybe it, get, maybe it doesn't work out, but maybe it does, but it's still, you still got to take, I think, ultimately that little leap into to be able to do it. Thank you so much, all of you. We've reached the end of our program time. Um, so I'd like to thank the audience as well. Thank you, everybody, for coming and um, enjoying this wisdom with me. And 
if there's uh, more food, please help yourself. And, um, and we'll be around for a little bit if you have any more questions.